F1 engines are the cream de la cream of engines. They're designed by the best engineers using the best materials and manufactured using a 3,000 year old process. Hold on, what? Well, as it turns out, they've been building their engine blocks by way of an old school method with a new age trick. It's called 3D sand printing. And today we're gonna see how it works. Let's go. This is the engine block from the Money Pit Miata. Now the block might be one of the least sexy items when it comes to modifying your car, but in terms of making sure your engine works, it's the most important stationary part. It's the biggest part of the engine and its purpose is to not only support all the components like the pistons and cranks and all that good stuff, but it also transfers heat. And the fascinating thing about a block like this is that it's been made using the same way for a very long time. Engine blocks are primarily made by machining or casting. Now machining, ooh, it's sexy. Okay, you take a big old hunk of aluminum alloy and you start cutting away material to shape the engine block how you want it. It's called subtractive manufacturing since you are subtracting or removing material and it's typically done by a CNC machine. Any machine part on a car is pretty nifty, but an entire machine block, that is super nifty. Okay, the scale's like this, okay? Not nifty, pretty nifty, super nifty. These blocks are stronger, lighter, and guaranteed to make your people say, Pretty nifty. Now there are a few downsides to machining a block. It's more expensive and you're limited to the internal cutouts and shapes you can make. If you have certain internal passageways or pockets for cooling, a CNC might not be able to do it. You're limited to the physical limitations of having to cut away material. For example, say I wanna make this hollow thermostat that I pulled off of Job's Miata. He didn't know I took it, but I did, cause I needed an example. The Job's Miata. The Job's Miata. He didn't know I took it. Now, if I wanted to see and see this part, it would be pretty difficult. One, because it has a lot of complex bends in it, and two, it's hollow. Now, CNC wouldn't be able to do the inside cuts that I would need to make this piece. I could do it in halves and then weld it together or do it in sections and clamp it together, but that takes more time and it's more expensive. So, how was this part made? Well, this piece was made using casting. And now my hands are freaking dirty. Clean your thermostat, Job. Now, casting metal has been around for thousands of years. The oldest surviving cast part isn't even a tool, it was a toy. You know what we should do? Maybe we should make our own toys, something like maybe a Miata. Maybe we'll make it. Casting is a process in which you take metal, you heat it up until it liquefies, and then you pour that liquid metal into the mold that's in the shape of your part. You let the metal cool inside the mold where it solidifies, and then you have your nice, shiny cast part. When we're talking about casting engine blocks, there's specifically two main methods. There's die casting, which you take your molten metal and you inject it into dyes under high pressure, and there's sand casting, which you have a mold made from sand, and then you pour your liquid metal into that mold. The molds have these outer walls that define the shape of the outside of the block with other cores that define the shape of the internal cavities. The molds are made out of glue, sand, and a hardener. When you mix these three together, it creates a material that can withstand the heat from liquid metal being poured into them, or as I call it, liquid hot magma. Each mold is made up of multiple cores that fit together like a puzzle. And to make each sand mold, a machine blows that sand glue mixture into an iron mold and it injects a gas to activate the hardener so the mold solidifies. Now once you have your base core mold, you assemble all the other cores onto it to build an entire system that is your engine block. Once the molten metal is poured in and has solidified, the part goes into an oven where the sand glue mixture breaks down and the sand is shaken out, leaving you with your engine block. Take our cast aluminum thermostat, for example. So the mold for this would have a few parts. The first is the two halves of the exterior of this thermostat. But how do we create the internal cavity so that the piece is hollow? Well, we create a second core that sits in between the two exterior halves. So when the metal flows into the mold, the internal core blocks the liquid metal from filling the inside of the part, leaving you with a hollow space. <laughs> we still cast a lot of parts today, not only in the automotive world, but in things like cooking pans, tools, boat propellers, patio furniture, mailboxes. There's tons of stuff out there made using the casting process. And there are a few reasons why. One, you can cast extremely large parts or parts with complicated shapes, shapes outside the capabilities of a CNC machine, like my thermostat here. Two, you can use casting when you need a part made out of a specific alloy. You can mix different metals to formulate an alloy specific to your application. 
And three, casting is cheaper than machining. When you're trying to cut down costs, this is a good way to do it. Once you have the mold made, you can essentially duplicate your parts much quicker. So if you need to make a lot of something, casting is a really good way to pump out a lot of identical parts. But what about when you don't wanna mass manufacture parts? What if you want to quickly change your block design to implement better features that improve your race engine? You wanna make some tweaks because you're a tweaker. You want the ability to quickly change your part design like you would with the machine part, but use the casting process to create the unique shape that your block requires. If only there was such a technology that would solve these problems. <laughs> oh my God, my phone's ringing. Hello? 3D sand printing? Oh yeah, you did write this episode. Okay, I'll see you this weekend. Love you, mom. My mom wrote this. <laughs> sand printing is similar to 3D printing, but instead of printing the part, you print the mold. You have layers of 0.25 millimeter thick sand that are printed with a layer of chemical binder in between each layer. You begin with a thin layer of sand, then the printer head sprays binder on the areas that will take shape of the mold. Another thin layer of sand is evenly distributed on top of the previous printed layer, and then the printer head sprays more glue, and you gradually create your mold, slice by slice, layer by layer. By building up a mold this way, not only is it faster, it allows for you to have some unique casting geometry that you couldn't get in a typical casting process. So the million dollar question, how does it work? Well, it's a simple, five step process. The first step is generating a 3D CAD model. Typically this is done by first creating the 3D image of the part, so that's something I would do. And then I would send it to a company that specializes in 3D sand printing, where they would take that CAD file and create a usable inversion for the mold. Just like with traditional sand casting, we have to create the reversed image of our part for the metal to take shape of. You gotta start thinking in, you gotta be an invert. Can you do that? It's really hard. Once you have the CAD file for the mold, it's time to use the 3D printer to manufacture it. And there's two ways in which it's done. The first is a cold curing process. The binder gets sprayed from the print head at ambient temperatures. That's why it's called cold, because it's just normal temp. Once the part is finished, it is already glazed, which makes it robust and suitable for larger molds. But for the more intricate cores, you need a stiffer, more accurate sand. So you need to use a hot curing process. Uh, an infrared lamp in the printer heats the layers of binder in between the sand to initiate the curing process and evaporate off any moisture before the parts are placed in a microwave for their final cure. The sand itself is a critical piece in making a mold and there are multiple types of sand that can be used. The sand has to be strong enough to withstand the thermal loads of 700 degrees C liquid metal, but also be weak enough to be shaken out of the mold. And when in contact with the molten metal, the sand will want to expand by about 1%. And now 1% might not seem like that much, but this is an engine block we're talking about. There are precise tolerances that need to be maintained. So for the sections that need more precision, there are different types of sand that use different chemistries and curing mechanisms. Let's take our thermostat for example. Now say we want the thickness of this thermostat to be two millimeters. A standard grain of sand is about 0.2 millimeters. So we would only have about 10 layers of sand built into our mold. Not only is this weak, but the liquid metal could penetrate between these grains, creating a thicker part than we specced out. So to combat this, we would use a synthetic sand that is half the size, 0.1 millimeters thick, and we would hot cure it during the printing process. This will increase the amount of grains in those thinner sections. The more grains, the more surface area for the glue to attach to, and the more layers we have, 20 versus 10. Now, when I mentioned before that 3D sand printing allows for more unique casting geometry, this is what I'm talking about. We can get away with making more intricate shapes with finer tolerances. Once the mold is printed up, it's time to pour in our nice hot metal. During the pouring process, the metal can splash around, which introduces turbulence in the liquid metal. And when you have a turbulent pour, the quality of metal, once it solidifies, is of a lesser quality. The molds, they're filled from the bottom to the top uphill, meaning there are holes in the bottom of the mold and the liquid metal gets pushed in from the bottom rather than pouring it into the top of the mold. Now, if we were to pour from the top, you expose the metal to air more. The surface area of the metal being exposed to the air with a top pour is much more than if we were to gradually fill the mold up from the bottom. So why does all that matter? Well, aluminum oxide forms when the liquid aluminum reacts with oxygen in the air. It forms a ceramic and that ceramic blocks the metal molecules from binding properly. This can lead to different materials distributed in the casting. If you have a non-uniform casting, you have weak spots. That's no brainer. You want buff spots like my arms, okay? You don't want weak spots. You don't want to hear about the weak relationship I have with my sister, okay? I want my truck back, Christina. I want it back now. You can only hide behind that boyfriend that you married for so long, Christina. <laughs> 
so we want to minimize the amount of contact the metal has with air during the pour. When the liquid metal cools, it forms a solid, and the rate at which it cools is important because you achieve certain functional properties out of that metal depending on how fast or slow it cools. Molten metal solidifies by transferring heat to its surroundings, which in this case is the sand. And certain areas of the casting can either be insulated to keep the metal in its liquid state or placed next to a heat sink that pulls the heat away so the metal solidifies faster. By adding heat sinks at various spots along the mold, you can precisely control the rate of cooling. And when you control the rate of cooling, you control the crystalline structure of the part as it transitions from a liquid to a solid. Man, I, we should do a material science episode because it's pretty cool stuff. Different areas of the engine block experience different stresses. The head of an engine is going to experience different forces acting on it than an engine mount, for example. The combustion process is going to fatigue the head. So if we cool that section of the mold faster, it will create a smaller microstructure in the metal with smaller grains. And those smaller grains are better at minimizing the effects of fatigue due to the combustion process. You know, tight little grains. Once the part has been cast and has gone through a series of machining and heat treatments, the analysis begins. This is all fun stuff. Most parts go straight into a CT scanner where a beam of x-rays is passed through the part and a line detector builds up the images in these very small slices. That data is then imported into a software program which reconstructs the image into a 3D model of the actual part. So then they take that 3D model and they overlay it with the CAD model to verify if the casting came out correctly. Then after that, you got your freaking engine block, baby. A sweet, sexy F1 cast engine block. Vroom, vroom. So the benefits of 3D sand printing are pretty obvious. One of them is you get to make many iterations in a quicker time. If you wanted to modify a part using older traditional casting methods, it would take you weeks, sometimes months, because you'd have to create a new mold and that takes time. But with 3D sand printing, you can make minute, intricate changes and get your part delivered in only a couple days. This is great for, say, someone who's in the F1 world. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of B2B. I think we're going to do an episode where I make a forge and I actually cast my own parts. Maybe we'll do some like special one-off keychains, B2B keychains or emblems, maybe freaking chain. Uh, I don't know if it'll make a B2B episode, but maybe we put it out on the underground. So comment down below, see if that's something you'd like to see. Follow us here at Donut on Instagram, at Donut Media. Follow me at Jeremiah Burton. Until next week, bye for now.